نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعسه ما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها ثم عرضهم على الملائكة فقال أنبئوني بأسماء هؤلاء إن كنتم صادقين قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابا آمين اللهم آمين يا رب So today what I want to talk about is the attitude of the early fuqaha of Islam What was the attitude of the early Muslim scholars? Why am I talking about this? And the second subject I want to talk about is the early formation of what we call Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. How was it actually historically formed? What were the events that transpired that formulated this entity we today call Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah? I think uh, these are two historical, historically important aspects that we should all be aware of. The first being the attitude of the fuqaha. I want to share with you, first of all, the difference between fiqh and sharia. Fiqh is, the literal meaning of fiqh means to understand. Sharia is the divine law God has given us. The divine law. And by the way, I want to share with you something important, which you will appreciate, inshallah. And that is that, when we talk about law, when we talk about law, in the Western history, in Western history, in the Western background, when they look at the issue of law, law always comes from the institutes of the government. The, the law always comes from the institutions of the government. Right? From the Supreme Court, from the courts, and all the institutions of the government. What you have to bear in mind about Islam is that the Islamic laws were not formulated in an institution of a government. What I'm talking about is the codification of Islamic law. For example, Imam Abu Hanifa had nothing to do with government. Imam Malik was in Medina, he had nothing to do with the government. And the same thing with Imam Shafi'i, and the same thing with Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal and others with them, Imam Lais and the others that were there, uh, Hassan Basri, for example, these people that codified Islamic law, these are the rules of Tahara, these are the rules of Salah, these are the rules of Zakat, these are the rules of Jihad, these are the rules of Hajj. They codified them, but they did not codify them in an institution of the government. Now, that is very important to know historically, because when non-Muslims hear the word Sharia, Islamic law, and because in Western paradigm, law always has to do with government, they automatically assume that Sharia means that take over the government and then forcibly apply the Islamic laws upon everyone. What they don't realize is that our background and our history and our experience of our Islamic law is very different from their experience of what they have gone through in terms of law. Anyway, that was the side point I was mentioning. The main thing I wanted to mention was the attitude of the fuqaha, especially in the early times. Why were we able to have such a wide variety of difference of opinions? You had the Hanafis who vehemently disagreed in many issues with the Malikis, with the Shafi'is, with the Hanbalis, and many other scholars, like uh, you have Tufat and Sufyan. We know four today because they've over time boiled down to four or five or six, depending upon how you look at it. But in the beginning of the time, in, in early on, you could count up to 14 different schools of thought that were taking place. And one of the most important aspects of these schools of thought, the attitude, 
It is the same as mentioned in the Quran about the angels when they were asked to mention the things about that were given to Adam والسلام, and he said he na- was able to name the things and the angel said لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا oh Allah we don't know the name of these things except what you, we don't know anything except what you taught us لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم indeed you are the one who is al hakim right alim al hakim the one who knows everything and is all wise the early ulama whenever Whenever they answered a question, they always answered the question with ending by saying, Allahu, Allahu A'lam. So they, they had this very interesting, what is today in the, in the world called postmodern thought. Postmodern thought is, you know, everything is relative. What your, 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 your right is your right, and my right is my right, and what is right to you, and what is right to somebody. It, it's all relative. It was in a way like that, but in a different way. In, in the sense that, I might be right, wrong, and the other person could be right. And the ulama, they accepted this. And this is why even in, even in, the, in Dar al-Ulum, even till today in Dar al-Ulum, they'll teach you terminologies that maybe not emphasized enough, but they're taught that we, uh, we are aqrabu sawab I believe I'm on the most correct path. But ihtimal lil khidah. But there is a chance of khidah. There's a chance of I, the opinion of Imam Hanif, for her example, is wrong. And the opinion of Imam Malik is, right, there's a chance, right? So, the scholars of Islam had this attitude from the very beginning where they didn't impose their knowledge on other people. Imam Malik was asked by the governor of Medina that if you want, we will take your book, Muwatta, his book, Muwatta, we will take Muwatta and we will enforce it upon the people. And Imam Malik, despite being as great as he was, he said, no, don't do that. Because it is still possible that I would be what? I could still be wrong. So don't enforce my book, Muwatta, my fiqh, my rules and regulations, my book, Muwatta, don't enforce it. And that allowed diversity of opinion. And so we were in the very early stages of Islam where Islam was still being formulated in terms of rules and regulations, Right? And ideas were still being formulated, and I'll give an example of that if I get a chance today. But the scholars were very humble, and they said, well, Allahu A'lam to everything, or they said, I don't know. Imam Malik was famous for saying, I don't know. Right? I don't know, or Allahu A'lam, Allah knows best. But the scholars of today, the attitude that we have today is, I read in one of the books of one of the shaykh, he's very famous, I won't mention his name, but he wrote in his muqadma of his book, he wrote, I have not deviated from Qur'an and Sunnah even to the hair, a split of a hair. I have not deviated from Qur'an and Sunnah even equal to the, the distance of a hair. Meaning you're so sure of your knowledge, and if you're so sure of your knowledge, what happens is you impose your opinion upon other people, you impose what you think is right because you're so sure, and you dismiss the opinion of the other people. And the scholars of the early time, they were the opposite. They didn't dismiss the opinion of the others. They dis- they, if anything, they were humble enough to dismiss their own opinions despite feeling that they were right. Despite feeling that I'm right in my opinion, and the other person is wrong in their opinion, they, dis- they humbled themselves. And this is why Sharia is the divine law. Sharia is the laws Allah wants us to follow. Sharia is the laws Allah wants us to follow. But the person who attempts, the person who attempts to follow Sharia is not called Sharia. Sharia means the one who takes you to Sharia. The one who clarifies that this is the direction to go to for Sharia is called a faqih or fuqaha or fiqh. Fiqh is the subject. It is his humanly attempt to understand what Allah is intending for us to do. It is His human attempt to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to do. Which you will then find very interesting when you look at the Prophet on this issue. The Prophet also was very cognizant that there would be a time where people would be have to have to make ijtihad of their opinion. There, there would be more than one opinion. And so the Prophet said, وسلم, the person 
who does ijtihad, and by the way, ijtihad means what? Ijtihad is from which word? It's a famous Arabic word that means to struggle, jihad. But jihad of the mind is called ijtihad. Jihad of the mind, the struggle of the mind to really contemplate deeply, which is what the word fiqh means, to contemplate deeply. The Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever Allah wants good for, He gives him deep understanding of the deen. Because if he has deep understanding of the deen, it makes it easier for him to follow the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Anyway, so the Prophet ﷺ said, the person who does ijtihad and does a wrong ijtihad, he gets how much reward? You do an ijtihad, you make an opinion, you look at the, what the Prophet said, you look at what Quran says, you make an ijtihad, you struggle, and you come to a certain opinion, and you make a wrong opinion, what is the reward of this person? The, person, the Prophet said, if a person does ijtihad, and he does a wrong ijtihad, he gets the reward of one, of one time. And if he makes a wrong, uh, sorry, if he makes a right ijtihad, if his ijtihad is right, then he looked at the Qur'an, he looked at the sunnah of the Prophet, and he makes ijtihad, and he comes to the right conclusion, he gets double the reward. So the Prophet was, وسلم, encouraging the Muslims to do ijtihad, to read the Qur'an, to read the sunnah of the Prophet, and come to an opinion, a legal opinion, and even if you're wrong, you'll still be given what? Reward. And this is something very important. Nowadays, when somebody makes an ijtihad, or makes an Islamic opinion, or holds a certain Islamic opinion, you, we look down upon them because we think they have a wrong opinion. Even though, even if they're wrong, they still get a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having that opinion. And if you have the right opinion, you get double the reward. But if they have, you know, because you, you will not know who was ultimately right or ultimately wrong till what? When? Till the Day of Judgment. You'll never know. And so, even in the time of the Prophet I'll mention two events that should make this issue a little bit more clear. The Prophet said, وسلم, None of you is a believer, or rather, the wording of the hadith is, the Prophet said, وسلم, If you believe in Allah and His Messenger, then you will not pray Asr till you all reach such and such place. Bani Quraida was the place. So the companions of the Prophet ﷺ are going, the time for Asr comes, and the Prophet said, if you believe in Allah and His Messenger, you will pray Asr at this place. But they were still going there, they had not reached this place. Now the companions of the Prophet start to argue with one another what to do. Because the Qur'an says, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوطًا The prayer times are fixed, according to the Qur'an says this. But here the Prophet said, if you believe in Allah and His Messenger, you will pray Salat al-Asr when you reach this place. So what are you going to do? So half the companions, I don't know if it was really half, but a group of the companions, they prayed Asr at that time, because they knew they wouldn't reach in time for Asr at Bani Quraida. And the other said, no, the Prophet said, we have to read Salah when we get to Bani Quraida. We'll pray Salat al-Asr when we get there. Now they were disputing with one another, and so what happened as a result? They come to the Prophet ﷺ and they ask him. They say, this was our dispute, this is what happened. What do you think we should, what should have been done? What do you think the Prophet said, ﷺ? The Prophet said, you're both correct. Both of you are correct. In another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, two companions were going. They didn't have water. They pr prayed with Tayyimam, okay? They both prayed with Tayyimam. Now, one of the now they come to a place. They have water, and what happens? They, the one of the one of the companions of the Prophet does wudu again, prays, and now the issue goes to the Prophet sallallahu again. And the Prophet said, the one who didn't do the, repeat his prayer followed the Sunnah, and the other got double the reward. Now. Scholars of Islam, some of them said, oh, it's better to have the Sunnah of the Prophet. And other scholars of Islam said, no, double the reward is better. The point being 
that the Prophet allowed for the Muslims to disagree with one another even in issues of fiqh, of, of Islamic law, even of prayers and hajj and so on and so forth. Inshallah, I'll continue in my next khutbah. الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء ما يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصه ما فلا يضر إلا نفسه فقال أز وجل فقال أز وجل وعلم آدم الأسماء كلها ثم عرضهم على الملائكة فقال أنبئوني بأسماء هؤلاء إن كنتم صادقين قالوا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه قولي آمين يا رب <coughs> So the first fundamental thing about the scholars of the past was their attitude when it came to Islamic law they were very vigorous in getting knowledge, but they didn't impose that knowledge upon anyone. They just said, this is our opinion, this is our finding, this is our ijtihad. And it was not institutionalized by the government in the beginning until the Ottoman Empire came. The Ottoman Empire was the first Islam Muslim empire, not Islamic empire. The first Muslim empire that imposed a certain legal system upon the Muslims. Now, that's for another time. But the other thing I want to talk about the other thing that formulated Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, this is what I wanted to talk about, the second part. And that is that something very interesting. What is the relationship between Aql and Naql? What is the relationship between revelation and reason? Revelation tells us in a direction to go. The Qur'an tells us in which direction to go. The Prophet tells us in which direction to go. What is the relationship between revelation and reason? A very important subject. Early scholars who believe that reason can give us the same conclusion as revelation. Listen to what I'm saying. Early scholars that believed that reason can give us the same logical result as revelation. They were, a lot of them were called what we call Mu'tizilites. Mu'tizila. Mu'tizila believed, Allah says in the Quran, أَفَلَا يَعْقِلُونَ Do you not ponder, right? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَفَكَّرُونَ So you may think, right? So they said that your thinking and your logic must automatically coincide with what revelation is saying. So this was one group of people, and they were very vocal. Another group of people, not from an a, a unscholarly perspective, but from a scholarly perspective, rather a, but from a, more, from a philosophical perspective, said, no, that makes no sense. If you say reason is equal to revelation, then that might, because then you're, you're, you're putting two things equal, and, and in that, there is a chance of deviation. There's a chance that you'll go in the wrong way. How can Qur'an be equal to... Uh, how can uh, Qur'an be equal to hu be human, human thought, which is limited, and Qur'an is unlimited? Qur'an is timeless, whereas we're bound by time. So the Ashariya, for example, they considered that even though Aql has a role in understanding Qur'an, <coughs> and understanding the signs of Allah in the Qur'an, but reason and revelation are not what? They're not equal. So this debate went on until... This debate went on until the time of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal. In a year or a time period in Islamic history we call Mihna, <coughs> where 
the Khalifa of the time was forcing the people on the Mu'tazilai thought on the idea that the Qur'an is created and not eternal. You probably all heard of this time period where people were being forced to accept Qur'an is something created, it is not eternal, and Qur'an is, meaning we believe, the Sunnah, Ahlu Sunnah wa Jama'a, Qur'an is eternal, it's the word of Allah, it's eternal. It has Allah's attributes, it's eternal. And so, when the... Khalifa of that time was forcing the Muslims to believe in what he thought was right, meaning forcing his opinion, <coughs> not based upon revelation, but based upon logic and rationale, based upon reasoning. And after that time period, to make it short, it was after this time period that the Muslims then realized that what the, the, that the Quran and the Sunnah, meaning revelation, has to always be on top of reasoning. In, after the event of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal and after this Mu'tazilite event that happened in history, Muslims realized, and because theoretically you can argue anything, reason is equal to revelation, but when they saw practically what happens as a result and what happened with the Khalifa that was forcing everyone to uh, become Mu'tazilite basically, then the shift in history turned towards Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So this is the other thing that I wanted to mention. Now, as an example, I want to share with you, you know, you must be thinking that, or you may not be realizing, rather, is the proper word I think I should say. Let me see how much time I have before I get into this. Um, okay, I have eight minutes, so let's see how this goes. When people study Islam, you know, they go to Medina University, they go to Darul Aloom, they go to different institutions to learn Islam. What are the things that they are learning? I'm trying to express this to you so that maybe you can appreciate the type of education that they get. Okay? So I'm going to use the famous book of Abu Dawud, you know, the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawud, the chapter of Hajj. Within the chapter of Hajj, there's a chapter of marriage. Okay? So I'm going to go over that with you with three sayings of the Prophet And I'm going to share with you the difficulty that the scholars have. It's not just, you know, when we learn Islam, when the average person learns Islam, he learns Islam from a perspective, okay, you have to say takbir like this, read your subhanakallah, then read alhamdulillah, then read the surah. But when you are studying Islam at an institute, at a seminary, your, your, your educational level goes to another, another level. And that's what I'm trying to express to you. That y you have to appreciate the, the type of intricacies and the level of sophistication the scholars of Islam have to deal with when they're dealing with all this Islamic literature that the Prophet did this and the Prophet said this and the Prophet said this. So I'm going to share with you one little, 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 tiny, weeny piece of this. Okay? So let's see if I can um, get it here. Yeah, okay. <coughs> okay. I'm going to shorten the narrations. But I'm going to read to you the narrations from Abu Dawud and then give you an example of the type of things Muslims have to, Muslim scholars have to deal with when they're looking at all of these like hundred thousand sayings of the Prophet and trying to put it all together in a way that makes sense. So here's one. One of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنِّي أَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَنْكَهَ طَلْحَ بِنْ عَمَرْ إِبْنُهُ شَيْبَ بِنْ جُبَيْرِ فَرَدْتُهُ أَنْ يخطر ذلك فأنكر ذلك عليه أبان وقال إني سمعت أن أثمان أبي أثمان بن أفان يقول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول لا ينكح محرم ولا ولا محرم ولا ينكح. The son of Uthman رضي الله عنه was in charge of a certain place during the time of Hajj. A man wanted to marry his daughter to somebody in while he was in the state of إحرام. While he was in the state of Ihram. So he's in Ihram and he says to the son of Uthman, 
let my son marry this person's daughter. And the son of Uthman says that I heard from my father, meaning Uthman, la yankihu muhram. The person who was in ihram, he cannot get married. If you're in ihram, you can't get married. Wala yankih. Nor can a person that's in ihram do marriage of someone else. This is one hadith. Now let me go to the <coughs> the second hadith adds a wording to this first hadith. I'm not going to read it because it's just one word. Nor can he make a proposal to marriage. Wala yakhtub. Wala yakhtub. This just narration adds this piece. Nor can a person make a proposal to a marriage if he's in a state of ihram. Next hadith. Same issue. Maymuna was the wife of the Prophet <laughs> She says, Maymuna, the wife of the Prophet she said, we were in the maqam of, you know, where you wear the ihram, we were in that place, but we weren't in ihram, and that is the place where the Prophet married. Next hadith. Anna Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam zawwaja maymuna wa huwa muhram. The Prophet married maymuna, his wife, while he was in a state of ihram. Do you see a difficulty here? The first few ahadith say you cannot get married while you are in ihram. Over here is another hadith that says you can get married or the Prophet got married to his wife while she was, while he was in ihram. Now the scholars of Islam have dealt with this issue in a very sophisticated way. Some of them try to combine all of the narrations together. For example, the Maymuna says, I was not in the state of Ihram. But it says the Prophet was in a state of Ihram. So some scholars said, we will take it as the Prophet was in Ihram, but Maymuna wasn't in Ihram, for example. Other scholars took it in different ways. My point is to say that when you are reading Hadith literature, when you're reading Hadith literature especially, you will see many contradictions. And unless you don't have a system Unless you don't have a system of how you will deal with sayings of the Prophet, actions of the Prophet that contradict each other, if you don't have a system in place, you'll be lost. And so the early scholars of Islam tried to define, okay, if there's a hadith that says A, and another hadith that says B, for example, a very, very simple solution that some of the, two of the, uh, some of the mazahibs they have, all four of the mazahibs. They hold on to this opinion. If there's two hadiths that have two different opinions, <coughs> one hadith says do this, another hadith says do this. What do you do? Well, all four agree. Let's look at what the Sahaba did. If the Sahaba, majority of the Sahaba did this hadith, according to this hadith, we'll do according to that. If the other, if, if, but sometimes even the Sahaba disagree. So I'll give you another example. In the same chapter, chapter of Hajj, uh, I don't have much time, so let me say this quickly and then I'll wrap up what I was actually trying to say for today. There's a hadith of the Prophet, there's uh, two companions of the Prophet argue with each other about doing ghusl while in the state of ihram. About doing what? Ghusl while in the state of ihram. So they argue with each other, they, uh, they ask Abu Ayyub Ansari, they ask another companion of the Prophet, and they saw this companion of the Prophet demonstrates how the Prophet did ghusl while in the state of ihram. But now the fuqaha, they ask the question, is this if he accidentally became junub, then he has to do ghusl? Or was this just, he was already, he is already, he has tahara, and then this is in addition to that. Meaning, that Things are not as simple. When it comes to Islamic law, there is a lot of things you have to consider when you are considering, especially the Hadith literature. Especially when you're looking... I'll, I'll give you a simple example and I'll end with this. This will be an interesting exercise. I like to do this exercise with 
people all the time, but I'm going to do this exercise with you to just give you an idea, so you get an idea of how sophisticated and how interesting, and these things wouldn't have developed if the early Fulkaha would have been saying, I'm right and you're wrong. These differences of opinions wouldn't have developed. So like, for example, a very simple one that I'll end with today, inshallah, and then we, we don't have time after this, uh, is the issue of Fatiha. Very, very simple. I'm gonna, I, time is running out, so I have to say this very fast. The Prophet said, La salata illa bi Fatiha. There's no salah without Fatiha. You have to read Fatiha. Isn't it a clear statement? And it's a negation. It's a nahi. The Prophet said, No salah without Fatiha. Period. But on the other hand, you have Imam Malik's opinion. Where it says, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَمِئُوا لَهُ وَأَنْسِتُوا Two times Allah says, Be quiet and listen. When Qur'an is recited, do what? Listen. وَأَنْسِتُوا And listen and be quiet. Both things are mentioned. So Imam Malik says, if the Imam is reading out loud, listen. And if he's not reading out loud, then you have to read it. So who's right? The Imam Shafi is right? Or Imam Malik is right. It, you would go in circles. Now take the Hanafi opinion, which is on the other extreme, which says that if the Imam is reading Salah, his Salah is your Salah. And the proof of that is if you join the Salah in Ruku, well, there's no Salah without Fatiha, we know that. So who read your Fatiha? The Imam read your Fatiha. If the Imam read your Fatiha, then you don't technically have to read Fatiha. Who is right? Imam Malik is right. Imam Shafi is right. Imam Abu Hanifa is right. So the early scholars, they were able to develop these difference of opinions. Why? Because they said, Allahu A'lam. Because they, Allah knows best. But the minute you try to say and enforce your, your opinion on other people, that was not the attitude of the early fuqaha. The early fuqaha always said, Allahu A'lam. They gave their opinion. They were 100% sure of their opinion. But despite that, they said, Allahu A'lam, and they did not impose, like I said, when Imam Malik was asked, we can make your fiqh the fiqh of the land. He said, no. No, don't do that. Because they understood, their attitude was very humble, and it allowed for a discourse, allowed for a difference of opinions. Which the Prophet did, as I demonstrated early on from the hadith that I was mentioning, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد إن الله يعملكم بالأذن والإحسان وإيتاء القرب وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكر الله يذكركم فاستجب لكم فأطيب الصلاة make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.